say a very warm welcome to Stefan and Reimel um, from IST Austria in the wonderful town of Kloster Neuburg outside of Vienna. So uh, friends from Austria, which are not from Innsbruck. And um, yeah, uh, they will be telling us today about their research uh, on using barren plateaus to do something, <laughs> using barren plateaus, using classic <laughs> shallows to do something um, useful in the context of um, variation algorithms, which is not related to estimating expectation values per se. Yeah, and then let's just take it away. Okay, perfect. So thank you very much for the invitation. So let's um, start with an overview of the talk. So first, I want to give a broad introduction to uh, what is a variational quantum algorithm, what are barren proposals, uh, what is the research that um, has been done before? Um, then I will talk about the connection between entanglement and barren propose. And then Ramel will take over and he will tell you about uh, classical shadow tomography. And then finally, he will tell you how to combine uh, entanglement and classical shadow tomography to avoid barren propose uh, in the beginning and during the optimization of your variational quantum algorithms. So, Let's start uh, with a general overview. So I guess most of you know, uh, a variational quantum algorithm, the idea is that the quantum computer implements a variational weight function. Instead of having some deterministic set of gates uh, that implements an algorithm, you instead use it as an ansatz to approximate some computational problems. So you could, for example, want to find the ground sieves in the Newtonian, you could use it to solve some optimization problems, some time evolution problem, et cetera. And you then encode your computational problem in a uh, loss function and a cost function, which could, for example, be the energy expectation value of your problem. And then you want to optimize these uh, three parameters. So you want to find the optimal, for example, uh, qubit rotation angles that um, represent uh, the, the solution to your computational problem. And you can think of this as basically trying to find uh, a good minimum in some high dimensional variational manifold. And so we will today focus on particularly on the variational quantum eigensolver, where the task is that you want to find the ground set of some um, Hamiltonian. So this could be some interesting quantum chemistry problem or some many body Hamiltonian. And the procedure is now as follows. So on the right, we start a um, quantum computer. We measure the variational wave function. Um, we get a bunch of bit strings. We take this information, go to the classical computer, and use the information to compute an energy expectation value and a gradient. And then the gradient, you use this information to update the parameters. So to basically iteratively go down in energy one step at a time. And so you have a feedback loop between quantum and the classical computer. And uh, questions? No, this is like no. somebody sat on the Zoom. And, and uh, you basically outsource everything to the quantum computer, what it can do well, so implements the variation wave function, and the classical computer does the uh, classical processing. And so it turns out that um, if you initialize one of those uh, variational ansatzes, so for example, this is the uh, hardware efficient ansatz where you have uh, single qubit gates, those are the, uh, these boxes with some variational angle. Um, and then you have uh, entangling gates and basically repeated this pattern. Um, and so if you initialize with some random parameters, it turns out that most of the landscape is uh, completely flat. The gradients are vanishing. And even worse than that, um, if you then average over uh, random initializations, you also find that the gradient variance uh, decays exponentially in system size. So here's the like the plot from the first work on these barren plateaus, where you see on the x-axis the layers, so how deep your circuit is, and the different <laughs> and <laughs> colors are uh, different system sizes, and the y-axis is the gradient variance, and so you basically see, um, yeah. With, you basically go down as one over two to the n mm -hmm. uh, in system size. So once you have initializing one of those barren plateaus in a thermodynamic unit, you can absolutely not escape it. And so this means that your variation answer is completely useless. You cannot optimize it. And with most initializations, you mean like 
ones that are drawn like from an epsilon approximate two design in some way, right? Some yes. circuit that gives rise to that. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. So this, yeah. So the previous work that has been done on this, um, one of the first insights was that uh, baron controls are dependent on the cost function at use, so on the, on the Hamiltonian essentially. And so there are two different um, cost function dependent baron controls. So there's the global cost function, which means that you basically measure all of the qubits mm -hmm. and you use this information somehow. And there it turns out that you have a baron control as a circuit depth of order one already. So really you cannot use it. On local cost functions where you only measure on, you know, a few um, qubits, there you have a transition where the, with the circuit depth, you go from trainable and then to untrainable. And this happens at uh, polynomial in, in system size. And so uh, you want to have a deeper circuit because you have many heuristics observations that this really helps with the quality of the state that we can approximate. And so this is a severe hindrance. And so another work in this direction was this idea of entanglement induced baron photos, where this was kind of the first hint that entanglement uh, plays a role in baron photos. And here they looked specifically at the setting of uh, quantum neural networks. And they looked at uh, hidden layers and visible layers. And they claimed that you know, volume law seems to be a problem with these variational algorithms. And they how do you how do you mean this? But if you say volume law seems to be a problem, yeah, basically you know you have uh, area law states and volume law states, and volume law means that the entanglement entropy of um, some type partition scales with the volume of that uh, subregion. Mm -hmm. And so basically here they they basically claim that you you know baron controls and volume law is you know in a way the same. Ah, okay, I mean, now get it. Yeah, okay. approximate them, but we will show later on that this is not. Not true. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. I mean, um, so I mean, you're not talking about. I mean, of course, it, it makes perfect sense to speak like of a target state. I mean, just think of a, of a Hamiltonian, and then the cost function say that just the the energy, and you want you could ask whether the ground state has a volume law of the entanglement entropy, but you're not asking for that, right? Mm -hmm. You're asking like whether the ansatz yes. class, yes. Yes. as such, would have like yes. a volume law. The claim here is that all ansatz ansatz that uh, Volume law that they that this is equivalent to a baron control. Or if, you, if your state is too entangled, yeah. you have a baron control. Yes. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, sure. But if you showed it is not true, then <laughs> yeah. we'll see. So it just that just basically to, to see what has been done. Yeah. And then um, very recently, there's been a very interesting uh, work on trying to understand whether a given ansatz has a baron control or not. And basically, the idea here is that you're unitary, uh, you have uh, your generators, and they span a basis. And depending on the scaling of the uh, number of basis elements, you can say whether a given ansatz has a baron photo or not. And this is linked to universality. So if your circuit basically is universal, you can reach any uh, state in Hilbert space, then you have a baron photo. And if it is not universal, then you do not have baron photos. But the problem with this here is that it's a very nice and intuitive insight, but you cannot really use it in practice. It's hard to, uh, to you know, figure the scaling out. And also, it doesn't tell you anything about how to initialize outside of a baron control. And yes, it cannot really be used. Oh, but, but to come back to this, like, entanglement induced baron plateau, I mean, um, oh, like, this is not like, like a, just a common cause that if your circuits are too deep, then you end up with barren plateaus. And then of course, deep circuits, if you like take the unit suspects of random circuits, they give rise to the unit, to the respective designs that you would want to see. Because there's lots of states that would have a volume law that would not, probably not have a yes. barren plateau. Yeah. Think of like, a, like, like a, a random graph state where you just have your random interaction pattern yes. uh, with um, control set interactions that would easily have a, a volume law, but they're very, like non deep and, and yes, then that's exactly right. Yes. Okay. The, the problem is not it's not volume though. The problem is typical things. Okay, good. That was my point. Good. Yes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Yes, but this was not made in, in, in this you know, this distinction was not clear. Work. Uh, I see. Work. No, no, I didn't want to criticize that work at all. I mean I just no, 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 no. Yeah. You say like volume law, like they, they consider typical entanglement, but they think so. It seems that volume law is a term. It's not volume. but that's more like a, a common cause that yes. for yes. complexity and too deep ansatzes yeah. that exactly. typicality argument give rise exactly. to exactly. 
yeah. unitary design. Yeah. Also, there is this notion of entanglement induced, but it's not really induced entanglement. It's rather yeah, 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 it's kind of like corollary there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Um, could you clarify the dynamical Lie algebra bit? Uh, uh, I want to talk about connection there. Sure. I mean, maybe Rama, you want to give more details. Sure. So, so like, because uh, like normally, I mean, like like people when people consider uh, so this idea comes from control. Basically, you have a Hamiltonian. Basically, you discretize like some totalization, right? And then looking at the at the terms, let's say of the Hamiltonian, you see those you see those terms as generator of the of the, the unit ellipse, right? And the problem is that what they have to what they do is like basically they just construct uh, like they just find the basis right of the of the of this Lie algebra, right? If the Lie algebra if the basis has uh, you know this exponential instance of four to the n, then then you generate you, uh, you generate basically. Uh, you will have a two designs, right? The two designs mm -hmm. will merge. And of course, there are cases in which you, you have symmetries, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the case, for example, when the system is in control, in control, in the sense that the size of the full algebra is not, uh, let's say, four to the n, but there are some symmetries in that sense, the Hilbert space fra uh, fragment, mm -hmm. right? But uh, if, the, if, the sub, if, the, if the size of the subspace is still exponential in system size, you will have the merges of a two design, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And for example, in this case, this irreducible. For example, if I have the transfer field is involved, uh, in that case, this, this you know this is integrable. In that case, you have the size of the algebra is basically n squared, depending you know goes back n squared. Just for the right reasons, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's basically like you know they have to they, they need to compute the size of the algebra. I mean, it's, it's something that is a classical step, but still, if if the the algebra is uh, you know, if it's universal, it would take you. You know, there are there are exponentially many terms in this thing. Right? It mm -hmm. would take. It's not an efficient protocol. Mm -hmm. for this. And also this, the fact that uh, if you have uh, the matrices of this, and that doesn't mean that it's not usable, right? So thanks, Mio. Okay, so let's start off with the connection between the and the pose. And entanglement. So the intuitive uh, explanation for what's going on is parameters is that your unitary is too random. The information that you are querying with your gradient that is not in the circuit is scrambled. Mm -hmm. And so mathematically, all of these uh, considerations they work on the assumption that your unitary circuit, uh, the ensemble of these unitaries, they form a two design. So a two design is made, means that it matches the high random. Uh, ensemble up to the second moment. So basically, uh, you know, you have an ensemble of random matrices, and then you can analytically, for example, show the uh, exponentially vanishing gradient variance. And so the randomness uh, is captured by the entanglement that is present in the circuit. So let's do the following. Let's uh, take uh, this hardware efficient circuit, and let's consider uh, two sub uh, systems. Um, subsystem row A and subsystem row A prime. And let's compute the uh, second grainy entanglement entropy of these subregions and see how they change with the uh, circuit depth. So here on top is this typical plot of the gradient variance that everybody in the community is looking at, where you have uh, the different uh, system sizes and this is a log scale. So this is this exponential vanishing of the gradient variance. And then here we consider half of the uh, half of the circuit, and you can see that this clearly coincides. You know where you see this uh, saturation of the gradient variance. It coincides where your um, entanglement entropy saturates to its uh, near near the maximum value, so the, to the page value, right? which is basically maximum entanglement entropy minus some small correction. And so this is. Yeah, but page value, you mean like the. Patient. The the how average for the same entanglement entropy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so for um, then if you consider a smaller subregion, obviously this smaller subregion will be uh, will reach maximum entanglement at a lower circuit depth. So this you can see in the bottom plot. And so we call this a weak parameter. So a weak parameter is if you check some small subregion, and the full parameter is if you check half of the uh, circuit. 
So this is the first numerical, numerical observation. And so now, in fact, you can uh, show that if you assume that your circuit uh, approximates a two, uh, is a two design, then you can show that the uh, entanglement entropy will concentrate around the page value. And this is true for all subregion sizes. And so now the idea is the following that we define a weak parameter as some sum all subregions, some small number of qubits, reaching a fraction of page entropy. And so the default choice here is basically just uh, as the fraction alpha of one. So it's reaching page entropy. And so the weak parameter is a necessary condition for the parameter in a true design. You require that all subregions uh, reach page entropy. And so you also require that the small subregion reaches page entropy. So, so that's a step in expectation, right? Yes. But it also uh, invariance is exponentially. And, and, and then you, exactly. The, also, the second moment is exponentially yes. small. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. OK. And so from this follows that the avoidance of a weak parameter also guarantees the avoidance of a full parameter since it's a necessary condition. And so the intuitive picture is that um, as the circuit depth uh, increases, you have a, you check a small subregion, and this subregion is maximum entangled with the rest of the circuit. And the size of this uh, subregion will grow with the circuit depth. And so first you encounter a weak parameter, and then it will grow to the full parameter. And so you will then see in uh, the subsequent section that Ramel will talk about um, that you are able to efficiently uh, figure out whether you are in a weak parameter or not using classical shadow, shadow tomography. And so if you avoid a weak parameter, you also avoid the full parameter. So Let's uh, use this knowledge and create uh, a Baron plateau free initial state. And so the idea here is that you have the variational angles in your quantum circuit. And so since it is linked to entanglement that is present in the circuit, we can simply slow down the growth of entanglement in the circuit by, for example, restricting the uh, rotational angles, right? So you start off in the zero state and the entanglement gates are CZ. So only if we rotate a little bit away from the initial state, will they actually act on the state and create entanglement. So if the angles are small, it means that entanglement grows slower. So you can now see this in this plot where we're here looking at um, first in red, you basically have the full normal angle range. And of course, you encounter uh, Baron plateau and then you have the uh, exponential decay in the gradient variance. But if you keep the angles slow, obviously this coincides with the slow down of an entanglement entropy that you can see here as well. And then your uh, gradients are well behaved. So now the goal is that we know how to initialize uh, outside of a Baron plateau It's rather simple. You just need to keep your entanglement entropy below the page value. And we also need to hold the, this condition to hold. No, why, 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 why is that? I mean, like in, in one direction, it's kind of clear. Like if you are too designed like, and if you have the, two, the page limits, page like regime, then you have a bar plateau. But why is the opposite true? Like if you're far away from that point, why would that mean that you don't have a bar plateau? But because it is a necessary. So if, if you are in a, in a two design, yeah. all subregions must uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. reach page entropy, right? Yes. So if one subregion doesn't reach it, yeah, it cannot be a two design. No, no, that, that, that is clear. But I mean, of course, <laughs> that's right. But yeah. I don't see the connection like why that would necessarily mean that you don't have a bar plateau. Because bar plateau is a one to one connection with the uh, with, uh, two design. Oh. Yeah. Mm. So, like, I mean, as as as, origi as, as original as originally. I mean, okay, uh, you, uh, as defined, I mean, or say, I mean, yeah, by yeah. definition, I guess. Or by definition, so okay, then then fine, yeah. Okay, yeah. But, but actually, this leads to another question I have. So, the what's the connection between page entropy and Baron plateau? So yeah, so. Oh, maybe one. 
like uh, so like two design. So on one hand, you have uh, two, uh, two design, which is associated yeah. with the emergence of R randomness, right? That's right. On the unitary level, right? Mm -hmm. But you also have state designs, which is more or less the same but for the sure. state, the state yeah. level. So yeah, if you assume hard, right? If you assume hard that the state is basically a hard random state, you would get page, right? You can prove uh, you can you can prove that the that the entire momentum okay. is basically the, given by the page formula. I see. Uh, the and then of course you, you may wonder, okay, but you know, to design that doesn't mean that you have page, right? But uh, but still you get pretty good approximation of it, right? I see. Uh, so you are quite close to it, and then there's actually also a paper that basically says that within you know polynomial n you get uh, epsilon up away from the, from the page value, right? I see. So, is, so the page this. entropy is like a weakness for exactly. This okay. is what how we use this. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the other procedure is that you check a small subregion. You check for a weak pair plateau. And you need that the uh, small subregion avoids page entropy. And if you have even more knowledge about your target state, you could, for example, uh, restrict alpha to be a smaller value. So in the numerics, we found that this can help with the optimization, but the default choice would be one. Like in the sense that you don't know anything, then you, yes. only, you said, I don't want the entropy to go beyond. Yes. yes. So for I example, if you know your, you know your target state is weakly entangled, you know it for some reason, then you could use a smaller uh, value than alpha being one, because you, know, you, you yes. do not need this amount of entanglement in your optimization since you, you, know, you target a low uh, entanglement state. So here you search over all possible subregions in order to check this condition, or? Because you just need to find one subregion for chips. Well, yeah. So, yeah. As in classical channel tomography, you can check all uh, simultaneously check all subregions of uh, a given size. But in the numerics, we uh, basically fix the one. one. Because basically, just check uh, one. Uh, okay. Because you basically have this typicality argument, right? In the sense, that in expectation entropy would be mm -hmm. uh, concentrated around around the page, right? But also, um, like in the binds, right? Those uh, basically having one already is not okay. right. To basically check for it. But, in, but you know, it comes with the price, but it's not too much the overhead that you pay to estimate all of these, all cases. Because like you're using more flux sort of to say like okay. basically signal the, the method. But isn't the typicality lost because you're in, a, um, in an explicit instance, like in an instance that has a low entropy and therefore it's not even typical anymore? Like the, the typical thing would have yeah. huge entropy. But you are at each step, you are at an instance with a weak entry, uh, low entry, right? Sorry, what? Like, I, I don't see where the typicality argument holds when you are in the iteration. Like, because entanglement, oh, okay, but this will come, uh, like you can overshoot, right? You can overshoot that basically go to the states in the middle, you know, the states of random states, basically. But, you, know, you can overshoot when, when you do optimization. I mean, but this will come now. If you just, but, but, but you don't start with random states. You start from the state of the low entropy. Well, but I said it's not very. Yes, you know, but if I have, if I have, uh, if I have, uh, if I have a uh, uh, Hamiltonian, right? Uh, let's say ETH Hamiltonian, then basically you in the middle, the states in the middle of the spectrum are hard, like you know, similar to hard random states, right? So there is when you look at the at the spectrum, they have a, like they have two contributions: ones that look like hard random states, and one that is like. Uh, uh, let's say problem dependent because random states are not, you know, eigenstates are not hard random states. Yeah. But, you know, basically the entropy that you get is, and you can check for the distribution, you get this magic capacity for distribution. But can, can I ask a very strange and a bit of devil's advocate question? I mean, uh, I mean, of course, there's many ways one can define bar plateaus, but if you define this to be like basically well, coming from a, or being the same as being an epsilon approximate two design, then that's what it is. Yes. But um, why would one want to have circuits that are epsilon approximate two designs in the first place? Because we know that I mean they're like good yeah, one yeah, size yeah. fits all ansatzes in the sense. Well, obviously well, they're not very nicely related to spherical designs in in, mm -hmm. in the way that you know truly pretty well. But that said, you also know that if you think of a spherical two design as a as a covering. Of state space, they're pretty awful in that you're obviously trying to approximate every state, but by that you're not approximating any state properly. You can 
compute like here coverings and then like a simple cardinality argument and then you're pretty soon pretty dead which means that if you want to really approximate uh, not dead then that's not going to function well well uh, does that resonate with your yes. sentiment I mean, I think the, or are you showing this later or, or no you're absolutely right but i think the motivation for why uh, these circuits are used and still in practice is because they're efficient to be implemented in hardware right you can of course yeah restrict the entangling gates to be precisely whatever uh, you know, set up your your hybrid grid as if you use a superconducting device. Mm -hmm. So this is why, but now they're still pretty popular and why, yes. especially in the quantum machine learning community where you basically treat the answers as a black box. Um, their argument is that it is a generic answer. Oh, no, no, I mean, that's what I meant with one size fits all. I mean, generic. But, but, um, but you can also play the same advocate uh, in the other way around. Imagine that I want to, to find the ground state of something, right? And uh, then if, you know, these two designs emerge because you're thinking it's universal. Let's, let's say that, right? If, if I imagine now I have a non-universal set of gates, yeah. what, what tells me or what ensure, you know, ensure, ensures me that I will be able to represent the state I want? I, I, I give you a kind of an, an, an answer, like rather a metaphor as an answer, which is I know, think I know. of um, ground states of gap Hamiltonians, right? I mean, there's two, two things one can do. One thing is yeah. your generic ansatz that's kind of two design like that does something, or I make a, a sequential preparation scheme of a, yeah, a short circuit, yeah, yeah. and then I know I get an NPS. And for yeah, that, yeah, we yeah. know that if you have a sure, have sure. ground state of a local Hamiltonian model, you have all these certificates that you will have a, 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 an efficient approximation of the of the ground state. So in the sense, a very highly structured and pretty stupid for that matter circuit will present a very good approximation of the ground state, whereas like a one size fits all two design like thing will not yeah. do anything. But you, you, you imagine you have, uh, I don't know, like uh, I mean, well, SYK like, and then you have on a graph or SYK, I mean, on a graph or SYK, and be as a representation that kind of. Yeah. Let us limit, yeah, 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 sure. Yes. No, no, I'm, yeah, okay. I'm saying, I'm saying just, the obvious just, that, you know, I mean, this comes back to the to the um, sentiment that you honest and some meat and, and others are kind of. Kind yeah, yeah. Of why, why being alive? That, that, I mean, if you have to use as much as you can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah. On, this, on this note, basically, hardware uh, on problem inspired answers. Like a QAOA answers, for example. Yeah. Uh, if you're, you know, I think there are like numerical experiments where they found that basically, depending on the graph that you use, you can also, uh, you know, create a random state. You can also run into parameters in this setting. So it's, it's still like, uh, you know, even if you move beyond uh, hardware efficiency you know, to some random circuit, um, there is still something that, you know, you need to keep track of. Fine. So it's not okay. Fair enough. Yeah. They also, I, I think, like um, it resonated a little bit with me, with me what Jens just like, said with this uh, other direction. You know, like this: um, if you have a band plateau in the sense that gradients of expectation values of observables, or let's say, are suppressed exponentially, um, or like only like an exponential yeah. small fraction of your states will have like significant gradients. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe you could prove that there's like a converse in the sense that if uh, gradients are suppressed for all observables or for like a large enough set of defining observables, then you will probably also have a state set which has some designing properties. I mean, um, I, I guess this is not, has not been done probably, but I, I guess this is, could probably also be true. Uh, I mean, like, yeah, like for example, in this control, control inspire answer set, right? How do you know? I mean, like, you know, you don't know. I mean, for for some set of gates, you know that they are universal, but in general, probably not. Right? Yeah. It's also not easy to check. Yeah. So it's, I mean, in some that sense, it's better to let that algorithm run and you know, try yeah. to avoid all these issues, right? Yeah. Because yeah. checking for for like universality is already quite expensive stuff. Yeah. No, it's more also like a mathematical curiosity if you. No, no, sure, 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 sure. Ah, okay. Ah. So, <laughs> so yes, so now, okay. So as Stefan said, the <laughs> sort of idea now would be to, to uh, doing optimization, continuously estimate the, the purity, right? Or the equivalently the secondary entity and check whether uh, it's, it's saturated, right? To the page value. And if this happens, uh, if this happens, you have to basically restart the, the full, the full uh, hybrid. So, okay, and for that, we are going to use classic HL. So, I mean, here is just a quick motivation, and I'm not going to go in depth into uh, classic HLs. 
But ideas like you know full state tomography uh, or equivalently getting the, the state, so to say, requires an exponential number of measurements, right? This uh, is complex. And uh, in that case, you know, many of the cases you are not uh, uh, interested in getting knowing the state itself, you are interested in knowing certain properties of the state, you know, be it some polynomial functions of the state, right? And uh, in that in that case, um, you know, instead of focusing on the state, you can focus on the observables. Right? And uh, there were like so this this child tomography was initially uh, introduced by by Scott Aronson and Broadwood, and then uh, made efficient for let's say these devices by uh, Robert Wine and collaborators. And uh, so you know, so, so some quick. Uh, Let's say you know the usual way you measure, right? Imagine you have Hamiltonian, which is the sum in some Hamiltonian density, right? And of course, depending on uh, on, on this particular structure of these Hamiltonian densities, we will require local basis transformations in order to measure measure every time, right? And in here, for example, we, we use this example of the sigma x step, right? You have to perform a Hadamard uh, uh, transformation in order to and then measure. In order to get the expectation back. And in, the, in, this, in general, one is, you can see that this the number of measurements that you require uh, for an additive error epsilon basically goes like linear in M, right? And uh, for this, you basically use Shelly Shell's inequality. And also, on the other hand, you have this classical charts with the idea is that um, uh, as originally introduced, basically you have uh, you have a state, a known state, and you assume that you have access to many copies of this of that state and then you have a unitary a unitary ensemble from which you sample some unit right and you you use those unities to basically do some rotations basically and then uh, measuring the computational basis to get some sort of information about the state and the, uh, originally as originally introduced there were two two approaches one is like local clifford uh, local clifford circuits and then the other one is uh, global clifford circuits but you know, here we will focus on local clipper circuit on the first one, which is the same as uh, random measurement uh, in X, Y, Z basis, right? Uh, and this basically, uh, the output is a bit stream, which you use them to create a, a classical representation of the states. And hence, then, then you use this classical representation of the state to compute some of several, right? Uh, here you can basically, there are some rigorous performance guarantees. And you can show that the sample complexity basically scales with logarithmic uh, of the number of terms you want to estimate. But now you have a dependence of the particular observable you, you are trying to estimate. And there is this uh, shallow norm, sorry, shallow norm that uh, for, the, for the type of uh, shallow protocol based on local Clifford's, uh, uh, local Clifford gates that we are using, it is basically uh, is upper bound by the, by the exponential of the support of the gate. So and then, you're doing local clippers and not global ones because they're just more fun. Yes, and also because we are also only interested in measuring local uh, local clippers. <coughs> Fair enough. We try to measure the I mean the superiority of the state. I mean, can't you just do maybe it's use is but you basically yes. can, uh, express the Renny as some sort of expectation value so it yes. does yes. yes. But I mean wouldn't suffice I mean suffice to just do like the, the like shadow twirl on, on just like the subset that you want to um, but, but, we, well, but we want to, to do many subsets, so basically all, all subsets, subsets of uh, size. Yeah. Right? And also, you know, you do measure uh, channels on, on the full state, and then you use that data to, to do right. uh, yeah. classical people like post processing. Right? And it's just as costly as, as only doing it on the subset. You collect the, the data once, and then you can use it to compute the radius, the radius the energy, and the gradient, etc. Yes. Okay. And yeah, so here the, again, like the, the norm is basically controlled by the by, its, by the support of the brain. So local, the more the local operator is, the easier it would be to estimate. And uh, so uh, yeah, so as long as this k is small, right? And uh, this child protocol is already based on this uh, sample complex is quite efficient, right? And it's of course the natural choice for most of the big three applications because basically you start. From you know the spins and then you basically do your short and different transformation and you have some local local lambdas right and uh, it's also as, as we comment like right, efficient uh, yeah it's also efficient to compute the Renny because Renny can be also expressed as some sort of 
expectation value, right? Now, of course, in the adult people say what expectation value. Is. And um, yes, so, and also, and also, you know, like in the case where for the estimation premise, uh, basically, this is the, this is, you can prove that this is how the uh, measurement budget scales. And in this case, it, uh, you know, it's surprising that it depends on the, on the purity of the states. So the, the smaller the purity, the easiest is to, to estimate. Uh, to estimate. And yeah, so in principle, we can check for all the small regions, right? Basically, scale and uh, in an efficient manner, right? And this, and you know, by doing this, we we can basically avoid emergence of this W, this weak, weak part of those, and hence avoidance of a full body, right? So, so yes. So now, basically, we go to some heuristics, right? With this in mind, right? The idea is like let's perform some numerical experiments and let's see what this is. But the but the algorithm, right? How that how it goes is like we first try to initialize outside of the of a battery bottle, and for for this there are like a plethora of uh, initialization strategies, right? We are not saying you know we just this one is the best or so nothing of the next sort, but you know we choose one which in in, in, in such a way that you are outside of the battery bottle. And then you basically do B to E with Charles, right? And uh, and at every step of the, of the optimization protocol, you check for the for the emergence or the appearance of this pattern, uh, weak pattern that does. And if this is, is if you encounter with the B, basically you have to fully restart the, the optimization protocol with a smaller learning rate. And we will see why the learning rate, you know, why the, the role of the learning rate is. And the idea is like why why we completely restart this because. Thinking the thermodynamic limit, once you get to this bar, because you will never be able to stay the state, right? Well, I mean, regions of arm, it looks just a question of what parameters you have. I mean, can't you, once you reach the barrel plateau, just like tune all the parameters back to like right before you, you reach the barrel. Yeah, but if you are in the bar plateau by gradient descent, you cannot also get out of it, right? Because the gradient is uh, zero in expectation value and the sure, sure. But, but, but you, you, in your computer, in your classical, Computation, you would still keep a register of all of the, the classical angles and parameters that you've been going through for the whole time. Right? So yes, that is, that is correct. Yeah, but yes, yeah. you will certainly have to, like, you can, once you encounter the barrel plateau, you could go one step back and then you would have to be very sensitive, right? Right. That's so, this is definitely a possibility. Of, but that's what, what you mean by, by yes. setting. So, basically, we basically say, okay, good. we start with a model. Because also the question is how far do you go back? Because yes, like I mean, if you only go matter. back one step, I mean, where do you go? I mean, you still go in the same direction, but you have to step very, very carefully that you may have very short steps. And I guess I mean, if you're already in the path in that direction, sure. probably you know, there are exponentially many stages which are bad. You know, yeah. Your yeah. Yes. But isn't it more or less uh, pretty much the same as you just instead of check for the curve plateau? Check whether you are stuck in parameter. Yeah, the thing well, okay. well, no, because there you would have to check half the system size, right? Mm -hmm. So this is so all if it scales with n, then it's exponentially yeah. inefficient, right? So you need to that's the whole idea of the weak parameter tone, that it's a fixed can... small subregion, which is so still so efficient. You don't see whether you are already no, we don't see it. So it's we know it's a necessary condition. Yeah. So if it's fulfilled, we say okay, we, we don't know if it's in a parameter or not, but we rather restart. <laughs> you know, now I get like the problem is that it's already <coughs> this is hard. Yes, yes, yes. 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 This is so, there, yes, having that in mind, yes. And is there no way to just include this like condition of not wanting to end up at a barren plateau in the in that day group? Like I mean you could like in some case lead to updating your your like optimizing your cost function, you could also try to like say, I don't know, minimize your 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 entropy. Yeah, so this you will see that uh, next slide with the but then six, um, if you, you know you could want for example want to use it for a model that has a volume low ground state um you know then you know almost maximum entanglement of state right so you would want to be able to i see use this and you know in general in order to beat any classical competition we do want to <coughs> so yeah, yeah like as i said like the idea of this learning rate right like, is that I mean here we do vanilla gray in the sand, right? We, don't, we didn't want it to complicate the things using some island optimizer or some something like this. 
And you know, and basically the the rule going going with this uh, is the update rule is basically this is this one here, and uh, in which you use the grain at the previous iteration to update the parameters in the iteration. And this eta is the value grain. This basically controls how much you move. Um, and of course, as we will see, like this la larger value grain is linked to a larger potential in the in entanglement between uh, entanglement chain between different apps. Right, and one way to, to, to see this is really by computing the you know the means of the farmers are all the kind of quality. Here, I mean, I have to be uh, to be precise. This is not the finals of the inequality because here we are using uh, the purity, right? Uh, but this is like finals finals of the type like uh, inequality. Uh, but so the idea is that what we do here is that we start with a state, right? And then we compute the entropy change when uh, by uh, after one gradient uh, descent uh, uh, update, right? For different learning rates. And you see how, so the, the smaller the learning rate, you see that basically you change, of course, your state at bit to bit, right? And you also change the entropy little. However, if you, if you choose a larger, quite large learning rate, you overshoot, but overshoot means that you end up in a high entanglement uh, uh, state, right? And uh, so ideally, you would like to be somewhere in between. So you would like to move because that will basically, you know, that translate to a speed, right? Of the convergence, right? You would like to move in the parameter space, but you, will, but you have to be careful in a control manner, so to say, right? In such a way that you don't overshoot into large in the entanglement region. Yes. Would you encode this entropy constraint as regularizer in your cost function so that you? Uh, uh, kind of don't have to go back and forth and just you have that constraint in mind and then you're optimizing. Yeah, I mean, like you say, uh, like something like Lagrange would probably say something. Yeah. Maybe some constraint that keeps the entropy low, let's say. I mean, like yeah. as you have for learning models, you know, where you just like put like some measure of model complexity. So, for example, how many or the total magnitude of your weights of a neural network, for example, and say, okay, you want to train your model, but at the same time, it should not become too complex. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, because you said I, sometimes you want to have a very entangled or very mm -hmm. highly entropic uh, yes. ground state. But I mean, you could mm -hmm. also imagine like turning this off over time. Where I say, okay, at, at the beginning, I want to not increase the entropy too much, but you now over time, you could. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, there are many things that you can do, right? Like, the most of the actually. This, uh, so we are using uh, not adaptive learning strategy, right? So the idea that that's not something that you would like to do, right? Because initially, if you are far, yes, you, will, you can move a little bit you know, faster, so to say, with the larger learning rate. But once you are close, let's say, to the ground state, you don't want the larger learning rate. Right? You want to decrease it in order to, to get closer and closer. But here, you know, there are so many knobs, right? But we just decided to you know, simplify some of the things. Right? And also, one, one thing is that a lot of people that uh, study this parent control business, they will use adaptive um, optimizers like Adam, and they actually will <coughs> encounter a parent control during the optimization. But since the system that you simulate numerically is so small, the gradient is still large enough, and you simply get out of it if you're adaptive optimizer. So basically, this would not happen. happen. Um, Keep it realistic. So I get this this uh, slide that you just showed with like staying in the, the low entropy zone. This holds for like if my target state also. No, no, no. The, the point here is really that between the updates, you want to be controlled in the change, right? Mm -hmm. So you imagine you're in this in this parameter space, and you first initialized in this parameter free region, and now you want to move in it. But you don't want to overshoot and end up in the Bernbato region again. So you want to have a low, a small learning rate yes. control. But at the same time, you want to have it as high as possible because if it's yes. too small, you just get it's trapped in some way. local minima and you make don't make any progress. Right. So there's a balance between the two. So it doesn't limit the the technology to reach at the end of your optimization uh, at all. It's just doing just optimization just between the updates. You want to be controlled. Before. You don't yeah, want to just... shoot into a random state. Imagine like you know some. It's not perturbative, but you know like slowly, uh, like adiabatically. Yes. Yeah. And so this is like the first. Um, okay, it's not clear. But, uh, so here, there's like some sort of numerics, right? And uh, for the big three, in this case, we choose. Uh, 
which was a Heisenberg model, right, with some magnetic field, um, longitudinal magnetic field. And we ran the optimization for different value rates. And as you see, right, so the red, right, in red, you have you have the <coughs> bottom plateau, right? And this, this is also captured by the by the entire magnetic field. So <clears throat> and also uh, I mean you see like with just one learning, one basically one update you run it directly to the bottom plateau. And the thing is because we are working with circuits we have in this case hundred hundred days. So at that stage you basically should have been into a into a two designs, right? But since we use this epsilon to control the world, then, then if you don't do the things carefully, you could just overshoot and end up in this region, right? So and then yeah, and then we start to decrease in the learning rate, and it's surprising, you know, but you see that the best the the, the thing that best the learning rate that, that works the best is not the not the smallest one, right? Because you know both of, you know in the, the green one and the purple one doesn't end in the bottom but the, the purple one has a faster you know, faster combines to the, to, the, to the ground state, right? And uh, yes, and for example, in this case. And the learning rate is not large enough to end up in a bottom plateau, but it seems that it gets trapped into some region, you know, because this large is jumping around. It has a, you know, it's not the it's not the bottom plateau, but it's some gets trapped in some local and cannot escape. And uh, so this is, for example, for the for the high server world. But then we said, okay, you know, this what happens. Uh, I mean, this you can efficiently estimate uh, simulate using MPS. And then we say, okay, let's complicate the things a little bit. Let's, for example, consider what happens when you are in a, uh, and this is a little bit cluttered, but I will explain. Huh? So let's have, let's see what happens when uh, we use you know, the same model, but now the three flavor uh, graph. Mm -hmm. And uh, here, the, what, what we did is basically to use different initialization And, and uh, sorry, the, and the role of the three regular graphs just to, to to mess up alternative approaches and be like yes. unlocal somehow to make yes. it hard for them. make it kind of um exactly yes. make it not obviously easy by other processes yes. yes. in a similar way like as we had uh, yes. result look at SYK models because yes. that kind of kills of the mill yes. kind of like approaches although there might be other approaches yeah, yeah, yeah. So, sure, sure sure first idea first example is to kill uh, tensor network example exactly and then you do one good. killing after the other would be the volume norm wonderful yeah okay. great <laughs> so and then here we use uh, so this small angles is a initialization strategy we have been using right so far and then there are like two famous initialization uh, that people have in the community have been using so far one is the so-called basic block and it's just that you have your circuit right and then you prepare half of the circuit with random angles and then but the second half right you just use the adjoint of the what you prepare the yeah. in that sense you basically have uh, uh, identity right at the end, but then you start changing the parameters, and this is like a very fine tuned, let's sort of say, uh, unitary, right? As soon as you change the parameters, you know, make it quite chaotic, right? And uh, for example, here you see that uh, after here because of the scale, but after all and the same iterations, this run directly into a bottom plateau, right? As it can be captured by the, by the globe of the time of the second plane as well. And the other type of, uh, of the strategy that we use is this layer wise. This idea that I'm adding layer by layer and optimizing, right? So I only have to optimize one layer at a time. And, uh, and uh, you see that, you know, of course, here, since we only consider 100 layers, this will only have uh, 100, uh, you know, only this goal until, until 100. But you see that it also goes into a parent plateau and gets stuck in the in the, in the middle of the spectrum, so to say, the, the point is, I think if you, if you, you know, if you completely ignore the bottom block and you just use one initialization strategy, you might yeah. think that you have actually converged, but you've gone into a bank at all. Oh, surprising! So it's not clear from the here; it's not seen because of the color somehow. But the, I, uh, but if you look at the zoom, you will see the, the there are some missing missing curves that are not seen here mm -hmm. somehow. Oh. Okay, I don't know. What, what is the system size rate today? Uh, here, uh, 10, but we went to 18. So can you repeat again? What, what is the difference between the, the blue curve and this uh, like light brown one? So they're both layer-wise, but have different parameters. At a parameter? So then this is layer-wise, so the green ones, they, they, they collapse. Yeah. The, the two green ones uh, are the layer-wise. The blue 
is this small angle of semi-saturation, and the gray is just the color here is not clear, but the gray one uh, is this identity of the semi-saturation. Is this the one that you have the secret and then you undo it, so to say? Uh, so that at the end, of the end, what you get is a uh, better identity. So the message is the initialization is not enough. You have you use one of the most popular initialization strategies, but during the optimization, you end up you with the right to the And if you do not keep track of the uh, entanglement entropy, you might think that you've actually converged. Or you know, because so you know, if you if you just plot here, you know, you don't know the ground state energy, obviously. You know, you just plot energy, and you will see how it has converged. Nice, my algorithm has succeeded, but actually you ran into a bear with it. I mean, I see so I mean, you're kind of challenging the idea that once you are that nothing's happening that you're good. And they have, might have many reasons. One being that you have optimized the setting, and the other one being you're just getting stuck. Yeah. I mean, uh, suddenly, suddenly, uh, this is, yeah, sorry, this cannot be seen here. Uh, it's actually the most important person to say, but I'm sorry. Yeah. So, this is what so powerful. Hmm? Email doesn't have such beautiful colors. Yeah, I mean, no, why? We didn't check for all blind. What's missing? Uh, no, it's like if you look at the uh, shared screen on the Zoom, uh, I mean, oh. like there, there are much more curves. Oh, wow. this is very different. Yeah. yeah, so sorry. Oh, that's right. Check that's right. Sorry. Um, just yeah, I mean, I think the plot is fine. It's just like the demo is also good. Yeah, so basically, it's, it's also too sunny. Yeah, I mean, yes. that's also a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here, uh, here, the, here, the surprising thing is that uh, this block identity initialization works the best. It's actually the okay. So here, this this one dash line is basically the ground state uh, second plane entropy, uh, the true second plane entropy of the ground state. And it's zero point ninety eight basically of the of page basically. Right. So it's high internet state, but also but it's not the still it's not a random state, which is the, what matters. Right. It's not a typical state, and this is what matters for the bottom right. Uh, then the. the, the I say the surprising thing for us at least was is that what was working, you know, working pretty well at the moment so far was this small angle synchronization. Didn't work as well in this case. Uh, in fact, what works the best was this block identity initialization, which is basically I do random initialization for half the secret and then I do it. And then, of course, when, when I start the initialization, the angles will be completely different, right? But this structure somehow is quite resilient or you know, works quite well when you have a uh, let's say large entanglement uh, state, and uh, so okay, we have we we are working. Um, uh, is there huh? do you have an intuitive reason? Yeah, so so, so, so works better yeah. for like highly entangled states. Yeah, so it's it's, 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 it's just it's main point. Yes, okay. it's it's just it's just at the moment a uh, guess. I say, yeah. um, but for example, all of these initializations, imagine right, this block identity, the initial state, you just start with, let's say, zero state at the beginning, right? You prepare the sequence. What you end up at the end is like zero state, right? You get the same cloud state, right? Because it basically, uh, this block identity prepares the identity, right? And then you have this uh, small angles, right? And let's imagine you put all angles to zero. You also have the, identity, uh, the, the same state at the end, zero. And then, of course, after you start more, uh, optimizing, the angles will change, of course. But you'll have, you start from the same point. And um, so we started, uh, and then we saw very different performance. Uh, and then we started wondering, you know, why, you know, why, where are they, you know, what are these, the difference, right, between these different sensation strategies, right? And what we checked was that the fissure. So why the fissure? The fissure basically, if you, you know, eigenvalues of the fissure, basically give you directions, okay, the largest eigenvalues of the fissure tells you directions in parameter space which, uh, you know, the fidelity changes the most, right? Between updates, so that's my uh, And what we saw is that in this small angle initialization, what you have is that the, the say, the, the, sub, the size of the sub, say, subspace associated with eigenvalues of the fissure, with largest, uh, you know, the important eigenvalues of the fissure is quite small. It's very small in this small angle initialization. Meaning that, and this actually keeps the same, it, it's been the same doing of this age. So the, the subspace in which you move is small. And so like this effective dimension of how people call it is quite small. However, in this block identity, you basically have all, all like in all directions matter. You know, so basically the spectrum of the fish is flat. Like, you know, one over, you know, 
I think you know, have some rules that say that the sum of the inverses will have to be constant or whatever, but you have like a plateau, so to say, in the eigenvalues of the feature, meaning that you have all of all directions in the uh, the parameter space do something, right? So it seems that uh, somehow this is important for when you are trying to uh, optimize a state which is high in time, right? Uh, if you have a state which is low in time, basically it's, so far it seems that uh, small small subspace is enough, you know, to optimize. Also, when, because you can check, for example, the overlap with the gradient at each iteration with the eigenvalues, eigenvectors of the feature, and it seems that. Uh, the eigen the, this overlap is larger with the uh, you know is the largest with the also it's larger with uh, eigenvectors of the feature with larger cycle value. So you know in the direction with the fidelity changes in the direction of the green. Yeah, so, so this is basically the heuristics we have at the moment. Um, I, I yeah we're trying to we kind of try to think a way to, to make this more rigorous or you know, try to make sense of out of this, but yeah, this is a still one. And uh, yes, so okay, so what's next basically? Uh, uh, we would like, so at the moment, we always assume that the secret or the set of gates which you have at hand first is able to, you know, it's a universal set of gates, hence, is able, you know, you know that for sure the two designs will appear, right? But imagine we are just given, right, a set, a set of gates and we just have to prepare the, the unitary, right, the unitary secret and perform optimization. How do you check for uh, for the margins uh, of, of variable dots, right? In that case, we know that in time it's not the number, right? Because in time it's just a number, right? And in the end, what we are what we are worried about is that about uh, we are worried about the margins of typical entanglements. So how do you check for typical entanglements, right? In general, and that at the moment the idea we have is basically we have to look at the spectrum of the state, you know, the full spectrum, or what is the same looking at many. Uh, at many many centers, right? And you know, with using using classical shells, you can also get an estimate uh, of the state itself, right? In the same way we, we use the classical shell to estimate some sort some sort of of uh, some sort of a polynomial of the state, right? We can use it just to do some sort of estimation of the full state and check for the for the distribution of the eigenvalues. If this distribution follows this distribution associated with uh, random eigenstates. It is this machine capacity level distribution. I mean, I know it sounds weird, right? But it's basically the only way, I mean, not the only way, but it's one way to check for the universe side, right? And this is what you, you have to avoid. Sorry for the typicality. This is what you have to avoid. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the error corrected. Yeah. Yes, error corrected. <laughs> so this is one, one, one way. And uh, the other way is, of course, it would be really interesting to, to see this implement, you know, to implement this on an actual device. However, the thing is, uh, we are limited by the size of you know, the circuit depth, right, of the uh, actual device. Although, what one would one learn from that somehow, right? Okay. Um, what would one learn from that? I mean, I, I also like to see things implemented on these devices. But okay, and so are... the noise. Ah, yeah. We would like to see what I happens see. with the noise. Okay, uh, fair enough, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> And then, of course, we yeah, we like to start <clears throat> try to understand uh, a little more what's behind this uh, under the hood of these initialization strategies and how to understand a little better organization. It's like at the moment, it's like a black box. We're just trying to see where to, to enter to try to understand. And uh, with that, yeah, I just thank you for your attention. <laughs>